I ask that you would open your Bibles with me to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. I invite you to follow along with me as I read aloud. Galatians chapter 5, the word of God says this. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly ourselves wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. But I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Let's pray before we dive into our text today. Our Father, it is an honor and a joy to come and worship you with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we woke up this morning and you put breath in our lungs so that we could worship the one true living God. We, you woke us up this morning with rain. You allowed us to approach this place with humble hearts, recognizing our identity in you, and that is by grace, through faith, and in you and you alone can we come in your presence. Father, I ask in this time that you would help us know the depth and more of the riches of your freedom. May we be in awe today of your sufficiency. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, did you know that the city we call home, Fort Worth, Texas, is the 16th largest city in the United States of America? It's pretty big, right? Did you know that it's the fifth largest city in the state of Texas? Now, now watch this, we're going somewhere. Out of the top five cities in Texas, it's Fort Worth that's poised to witness the most explosive population growth over the next 20 to 25 years. So Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, it's, it's, it's not them, it's us. It's Fort Worth, Texas getting ready to explode. You know, currently our population sits at around 800 to 830,000, depending on who you ask, or depending on what internet source you look at. But experts predict that Fort Worth's headcount will approach 1.5 million by the year 2040. Can you say growth spurt? That is a lot of people. Now, in an effort to help usher in this explosive growth in population, downtown Fort Worth recently, within the last couple of years, completed a rather large renovation. Have you been down there? Can you say Cheesecake Factory? <laughs> now I'm telling you, this renovation is quite impressive. What's been done, what's been remodeled, what's been installed, what's been taken out, it's amazing. Did you know that our downtown destination has been recently ranked in the last couple of years, okay, at one point or another was ranked by a magazine as being the number one downtown in all of America. That's real stuff, go Google it. Did you know that what makes this downtown so 
incredible, in my opinion, outside of some of the things I've already mentioned, is the fact that, you know, you just go down there and sometimes you just feel safe. I kind of like the idea of not having the sense I'm about to be mugged. And that's why I live in Fort Worth, Texas, and not any neighboring cities. We won't say names. But, you know, the reality is this renovation has done quite a work. I was in downtown just the other day, and I was meeting friends at the Cheesecake Factory. And if you can't tell, I really like that place. And the reality is this. I, I'm, I'm getting out of the car. I'm stepping onto the sidewalk, and I'm, 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 I'm just making my way to the Cheesecake Factory to say hello to some friends. And um, all of a sudden, a car just comes barreling by the street that I'm walking beside on the sidewalk. And this car had clearly made a wrong turn. Clearly. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the staples of many downtowns is that they have these things called one-way streets. And um, downtown Fort Worth, Texas has several of them. And you should be careful. You should know that. Like most downtowns, we have a number of them. And, and I'm just down there, and I'm, and I'm approaching the door, and here comes this car. Like I said, it clearly, plain as day, had made a wrong turn. And this car is just cruising along. And clearly, clearly, uh, this car is turning some heads. Um, it's getting some pretty frantic waves um, from nearby pedestrians. Um, I'm just kind of orienting myself to what is happening, but once I see what's happening, you know, I too join in on the frantic waves um, that you're, you know, and, and they just join in with these fellow pedestrians and just begin to shout, you know, you know you're going the wrong way. And, and, and why do we do that? Why, why in that moment when you see someone going the wrong way, when you see a car driving the wrong way, you start to, you know, get a little boisterous about wanting them to know that the direction they're on is directly involved on a crash course. And so you just begin to get a little boisterous. And if that was you, it's, it's okay. But just know that I normally don't boisterously wave at people like that, just to be fair. But the reality is this. You make a big deal out of something when you see someone on the wrong course. Because you know that the inevitable is about to happen. Well, shortly thereafter, the brake lights slide up, and this lengthy, you know, forward-reverse, forward-reverse process takes place called a U-turn, and they get going the right way. Now, just like these pedestrians, in my experience the other day in downtown Fort Worth, were frantically waving down this car. We see Paul in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul frantically waving down this church saying, you're going the wrong way. We have to press pause. You have to stop, turn around. All throughout this letter, if you know anything about this letter, Paul is just so perplexed by the churches in Galatia. Because you see, Paul highlights throughout this text, they had started out so well. They had started out so well, yet how did they so quickly steer away from the gospel and instead turn to a false gospel? And we find Paul, and you can, for proof of this, just look at chapter 2, verse 4. We find Paul just almost a little bit angry due to the fact that, according to chapter 2, verse 4, a group of false brothers slipped into the church so that they could teach the Galatians to neglect the freedom that's found only in Christ and instead essentially teach, hey, let's just all go back to enslavement. Now, the problem with this is that the gospel is the gospel of freedom. Now, what is the gospel? The gospel says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The gospel states that we need to know this truth, Jesus. And when we know this truth, we can be set free. And whom Jesus sets free, and if Jesus sets you free, you are free indeed. Now this morning, in our text, we're going to look at the purpose of our freedom in Christ. And we're going to look at three principles to apply. That is a posture to embrace, a practice to employ, and a persuasion to avoid. So first, 
What is the purpose of our freedom in Christ? Verse 1 has the answer for us. Read along with me. For freedom, Christ has set us free. So the answer, according to Paul, that is that Christ has set us free so that we can be free. Now, this is just a bit of an obvious answer, right? Like, why do I want you to experience this freedom? Oh, it's so that you can be free. Why did the Galatians... Why is Paul having to remind the Galatians that the purpose of freedom is so that they can be free? The reason for this such, such an obvious statement is that the Galatians were tempted to being pressed backing, back into the law, circumcision, as a means for salvation. And apparently, what you and I need to be aware of here is apparently, according to this context, of this passage, freedom can be forgotten. And freedom can be rejected. Can you just picture with me this morning a prison? And if there's a prison warden, which they all have them, and they got these prison wardens, and, they, and they, they walk out of the prison one day, and they walk into the cell block, and they walk to whichever prisoner they first see through the little, little, little circle. I've never been in prison, so I don't really know what I'm talking about here. But the reality is this. You, 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 the warden walks up to this prisoner and he he gets the key and he unlocks the door and he opens the door and he looks at that prisoner and he says you're free to go your time has been served you're free to go what does that prisoner do well first of all he realizes he's no longer a prisoner and I say I've never been in prison I've never been in that kind of prison I've been in this kind of prison but the reality watch this Does, does that prisoner does he then just sprint outside of the cell and going and looking for another cell? And he just leaps up and he just sprints to it and he goes to whatever cell door is open and then he slams the door shut and he says, oh, I'm finally home again. I don't think that's what happens. I don't think that's what happens at all because it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. The other day I was, I, was at, I, I needed some Starbucks, okay? So I'm, I have a long drive ahead of me. So I go to the Starbucks and I finally found one that had a drive through It's a rarity these days. And, I'm, and I find this drive through and I'm, I'm waiting in this drive through uh, for what seems like forever because apparently I think a manila chai tea latte is worth it. And, and I'm sitting there and just waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally my car gets to the window and I, open, I roll down my window. She, the barista opens up their window and, and, and they tell me this Hey, sir, you know, I've got some good news for you. Um, your, your order, I just sensed a twinge of judgment, so we're going to change it to black coffee, okay? Um, your order has been taken care of. Now, I hear these words, and I, I get a little excited. I'm like, man, I've never been part of this. And I've always heard it happening to other people, but I've never, you know, really experienced it myself. And so what do I do? I look at the, the reason. I said, hey, hey, no, thanks. Actually, I demand that I pay for this. Here, take my money. And then I whip back around to all the way back in a much longer line at this point, And I sit and wait to replace my order. Yeah, that's not what happened. That's not, that's not what happened. You see, freedom is for the purpose of being free. Paul is having to remind the Galatians that they've been the recipients of a pay it forward. Now, I wish I could say that I remembered to pay for the persons behind me, and I apologize. I did not, and I feel really bad about that. But the reality is this. Paul is saying, you've been the recipient of a pay it forward. Someone went before you. They've paid your order in full. You don't have to go back and attempt to pay for something that's already been paid for. You get to boast in the fact that it's already been done. Because for freedom, Christ has set us free. The Galatians needed to hear such an obvious statement. Again, because they were turning back to the law and circumcision in order to obtain a right standing with God. You see, the problem with that is all the law ever did was reveal our depravity and ultimate separation from God. The law never freed us. It only revealed to us our status of enslavement. Here's the key. 
We are incapable of offering a moral act or moral acts in order to obtain salvation. Paul is ringing this bell very loudly. His hands are waving frantically. His pulse is racing because this is critical. There is nothing you, can, you and I can do to earn our salvation, to earn our right standing with God. So enters the gospel. Christ was sent to this earth to live a life in which he upheld the law to perfection. Then laying down his life to please the will of the Father, he freed the hearts of men. Now we believers experience this freedom from the law because we've been delivered by the shed blood of the Lamb. Now, in regards to our time here on this earth, let's look at this answer to this question. What is at the pinnacle of our freedom? In regards to our time here on earth, what is at the pinnacle of this freedom? It is important to know that at the pinnacle of this freedom is our honor and our joy to walk and be led by the Holy Spirit. Our freedom is not a freedom to sin, but rather it is a freedom from sin. This freedom is for the purpose of following Jesus while being led by the Spirit so that we can keep in step with the God of this universe, that is without a doubt the greatest invitation ever extended or offered to mankind. But watch this, like the Galatians, because of your, because your emotions have the ability to turn you around and cause you to go the wrong way down a one way, because our culture opposes even the thought of absolute truth, and because your circumstances at times have you thinking that you're in lockup, I have to remind you of where we are at positionally with Christ Jesus. Positionally, we stand in freedom. And just like the Galatians, we have to oppose the thoughts and the actions or the attempt of going back into a position of re-enslavement. Now, at least this leads us to our first principle to apply this morning. And continuing in verse 1, we see a posture to embrace. You want to you wage war on the thought of going back to enslavement? Here's our posture to embrace. Verse 1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Therefore, Paul says to continue and stand firm. Stand firm. Present tense, right here, right now. Continuous, stand firm. You know, if we're not careful, we'll be the ones traveling the wrong way down a one way. So how is it that we should stand firm in the freedom that Christ has accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection? Standing firm means that you dig your feet so far into the ground and not be moved by a false gospel and all of the principles that a false gospel embeds, such as false teaching, such as a false identity. We wage war against those things because those things are no gospel at all. They have no room in our hearts and in our minds. So my question to you is this. What is your plan to grow spiritually? What action steps are you taking to deepen your faith in Jesus Christ. How is your root system? Now, here's why these questions are so important. The Galatians proved this to us. To be unintentional about your spiritual growth is to be intentional about your spiritual decay. To be unintentional about your spiritual growth is to be intentional about your spiritual decay. I realize that a lot of us depend upon experiences, either the really extreme lows or the extreme highs, and oftentimes we look to grow in those moments as we should. Do those things help us to grow? The, the, the lows of pain, the highs of joy, yes, they certainly do. They, the God uses those to teach us. 
and to sanctify us and to conform us into his image. It's a beautiful thing. But I wonder if I'm talking to someone in the room that if you had to point to something low and if you had to point to something high, it would be something like, you know, I ran a few minutes late to church this morning. That's my low. Oh, man. You know, I, you know my high school's out for the summer. That's awesome. But if that's really where you're at, there's something to greater rejoice in. And it's the fact of not letting your faith be driven by your circumstances. It's the fact that in Christ Jesus, we have been set free to make disciples that make disciples. For ultimate freedom in Jesus Christ here on this earth commands us to take part in the Great Commission. And we're free to do so. And he even equips us to do so. So friends, the posture that we need to embrace is that of one of standing firm, like a tree deeply rooted in a raging storm. I'm from Canton, Texas. Originally, if you've heard Canton, Texas on the news lately, it's because they had like something like seven to eight different tornadoes touched down in the county just a few weeks ago. Two of them swept over parts of Canton, Texas. It was not that big to begin with. And now there's just a little bit less. The reality is this. I've heard story after story of going back home and just listening to my parents talk about what all God's done and is doing to use this. I'm telling you, there are some people that you got, to, at times, they figured out really quick, you have to hunker down. When an E4 is sitting over on top of you, you have to dig your feet in the ground and pray to the Lord of, of heaven that he will hold you down. And in light of salvation, in the context that we speak of today, God has got you. You're not going anywhere. There's no storm. There's no, there's no unjustification in Christ. He's got you, and he wants you to be planted firmly into the ground. So what do we do? We take the posture of standing firm. And the text says, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The, the Galatians were mostly of a pagan origin. And what, the Paul, what Paul is saying to them is, look, you've been delivered from bondage. Why would you go back to the same bondage that's just dressed up differently in the form of legalism? He's saying stand firm so, so that you don't digress back, so that you don't go back to your former self. And when I say that phrase, former self, some of us go, nah, I mean, if you know me, you really know that you would know that I don't have a former self. But what I'd like to show you is that the Bible, the word of God says that you, we, me, us all have a former self and that we were dead in our transgressions. And that embedded in our DNA is a sin nature. We had no spiritual pulse and the God of heaven wants us to see that there are people around us in this great city that are without a spiritual pulse. And they need a neighbor and they need a coworker who loves Jesus enough to approach them and just become their friend and show them and share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he just says, stand firm because you think you may be without a former life, you have this former life. You and I share the experiences of a former life. Whether you were born and raised in church and you went into Sunday school and you had the Dixie cup full of goldfish and you had the flannel board of the story of whatever on it, I'm telling you, we have a former life. And the Galatians so desperately needed to understand this, just like you and I so desperately need to understand that it is important that we not go back to a yoke of slavery. You see, no matter the style of our sin, sometimes we think that someone, you know, gets a little more airtime because their story is a little bit more flamboyant than ours. You were both dead in your transgressions. We were both dead in our sins. The color of the casket may look different, but dead is dead. And you were dead in your transgressions. So no matter the style of sin, it all creates the same distance and separation between us and God. That speaks to the severity of our sin and the holiness of God. Now here's the good news. 
Nothing and no one else but Christ has the power to save. And for proof of that, look at with me at verses two through four. Read along with me. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. Paul tells the Galatians that if you accept circumcision, you are rejecting Christ. Let's press pause here for just a second because the Galatians, they're, they're, they're coming to the realization that yes, we believe Jesus is real. They're, they believe in the reality uh, of the cross, but they just don't believe in its sufficiency. And the problem with that is they're, they're accepting circumcision and Christ. Now, how does accepting both the reality of Jesus and circumcision works-based, how does that equate to a rejection of Jesus Christ? Well, John Stott has, has this to say. Circumcision stands for a religion of human achievement, of what man can do by his own good works. Christ stands for a religion of divine achievement, of what God has done through the finished work of Christ. Circumcision means law, works, and bondage. Christ means grace, faith, and freedom. Every man must choose, and behind our choice lurks our motive. It is when we are bent on flattering ourselves and others that we choose circumcision. Before the cross, we have to humble ourselves because no one, no one can come and present themselves as clean in the presence of God without the applied shed blood of Jesus on the cross. And you say, that sounds so simple. And it does. That's, I think Paul is, one of the reasons he's so perplexed is like, Who came up into your circle and fed you this? You started out so well. But what you and I have to do when we put ourselves in front of the mirror, the word of God, we have to be real with ourselves and transparent and say, if I'm not careful, I can be the one cruising down the wrong way on the one way. And the way we put ourselves in check as we see, as we follow along. But I want to make a note right here in chapter, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 4. In verse 4, you see something that kind of strikes your, gets your attention a little bit. Um, just know that when it says you are falling away from grace, that Paul is not alluding to uh, the doctrine of the, of the, per, the, of the perseverance, of the, the preservation of the saint. That's not what's happening here. Uh, no one that's been justified in Christ can all of a sudden at some point just be unjustified? Rather, perhaps that person did not know Christ to begin with. Rather, Paul is saying that when a believer begins to live under the law for the purpose of obtaining salvation, he, she is rejecting salvation by grace. This is so key, church. You and I have to be so careful not to mix and match our theology and our doctrine based upon the pathways of our culture, how we may feel about something, and we not even be led by our own circumstances. We have to stick to the truth that's found in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone because we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, in order to rightfully relate to God and His grace, There's another principle that we need to apply from this text. Number two, a practice to employ. Read with me in verse five and six. For through the spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. There's the motive that we talked about earlier. Our practice to employ is threefold. It's found right there in the scripture, verse five and six. Number one, we are to live a life that's to be led by the spirit as opposed by being led by the flesh. Have you ever heard that statement? 
Crucify the flesh. Feed the spirit. Feed the spirit. Crucify the flesh. Number two, live by faith that's motivated and driven by genuine love for Jesus Christ. And some of you are sitting there going, I I want that to be me. I I don't wanna come here just out of regularity. I don't wanna come here just because my neighbor has an expectation that I sit with them. I don't wanna come here just because it's what I've been doing for the past however many years of my life. I would much rather have it be because I have a heartbeat instilled inside of me that says Jesus is better and he's more greater than anything else and anyone else that this world has to offer. And that can be you. The reality of this situation that we get in sometimes where we go into these seasons of dryness. When you're just sitting there going, God, what are you doing in my life? One of my favorite questions to ask a college student is to walk up to them and begin a conversation and say, Hey man, what's God teaching you? What's God showing you? And for those that that know me, they've gotten used to this. And for those that don't know me, they get used to it. But the reality is this. We ought to really be able to answer that question because of the freedom that we've been given in Christ. So number two, live a life by faith that's motivated and driven by a genuine love for Jesus. You want to capture this genuine love for Jesus? You want God to capture you? You just fall on your knees. He says, anyone who's weary, you burden, come to me. I'll give you rest. I'll give you a hunger. I'll give you a thirst. I'll give you a motivation to strive and follow hard after me, even in the most raging of storms. Jesus can do that because of the freedom that he's given to us. Number three, a practice to employ is threefold. Number three, a life lived in patient waiting for the promise we have in Christ, as opposed to waiting and seeing if we can just create our own righteousness, our own good standing with God based on good works. You see that in verse five, for through the Spirit, by a genuine faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Positionally, you and I as followers of Christ, we have been declared righteous. And that is because of what freedom is. It sets us free. It's very important to note and to to view and understand the sufficiency of Christ and the work that he's done on the cross. Otherwise, your vantage point of freedom becomes looking from inside a prison cell, looking out the peephole of a prison cell door. And that is not our vantage point of freedom. Rather, our vantage point of freedom is viewed through the very lens of the cross, the very completed work of Jesus Christ. Now, a third and final principle to apply, we're going to see it in verse 7 through 12. A third and final, it's a a persuasion to avoid. Watch with, read read along with me, watch carefully. Verse 7 through 12, you, you were running well. Paul says, you you started out so well. And he's being very personal, very intimate. It's like he's talking to individuals here. You were doing so good. Can any of you relate to that? And from Genesis to Revelation, we we see ourselves in the word of God. And he says, you you just started out so well. But, But who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who was it that you valued their input in your life more than you valued the input of Christ Jesus? This persuasion, verse eight, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. You see, because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I just, I have confidence in the Lord that you'll take no other view. And you see absolute truth here? There is no other view. In light of salvation, Christ Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And, and, and look, I, the one who is troubling you, they're going to bear a penalty, whoever he is. Verse 11, but if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the fence of the cross has been removed. I wish that those who unsettle you would go and emasculate themselves. Let's just look at the false characters. Let's look at the characteristics of a false teacher in verse 7 through 12. This is important for us to understand and grasp. 
What do they do? Look at verse seven. They distort and hinder what's true. What is the characteristic of a false teacher? They distort and they hinder what's true. In verse eight, they're teaching. It's not from him who called you. It's not of God. It's substance isn't from God. They may pick and choose parts of the Bible. They may get to pick and choose what their theology, what their doctrine looks like and what they're teaching. But if you don't consider from Genesis to Revelation, the scripture in its entirety, we've got a problem. That's not the the picking and choosing and, and, and just belittling the gospel, cutting it out and taking out the piece, applying the pieces you want and, and not applying the pieces you don't want. It just doesn't work that way. This is not from God. And then verse nine, their teaching will cause infection throughout the church. In verse 10, look what they have coming to them. They will be judged. In verse 11, they, they, they even persecute true teachers, which in this case is Paul. In verse 12, Paul has such descriptive thoughts on the matter due to the fact that no one should ever hinder anyone from the truth and clarity of the gospel. Now here's the reality. At some level, to some degree, as follower, as a follower of Christ, at some level or some degree, you are a teacher to some degree. And the reality is this, just because you don't have a pulpit you get to come stand up on on a Sunday morning does not negate the fact that you got a platform to stand on other, other six, seven days of the week. Who you are in Christ Jesus is free. And there's a watching, viewing world that is so desperate to know this freedom that's found in Christ Jesus and Christ alone. my heartbeat uh, that God has given me is to live maybe not literally but live on a college campus I spent four years on one myself I don't need to go back but I love to go back because you see these freshmen coming in into a new environment and they got eyes wide open oh man their sensory images are going off the chain they're just they're overwhelmed A new sense of freedom, I mean, new cafeteria that has a buffet. All of these things that they're just overwhelmed by. And oftentimes, you see these freshmen walk in, and they're just on cloud nine. And that cloud nine typically lasts at least through the freshman year, sometimes longer, sometimes less. But from my experience, oftentimes you sometimes get to talk to a sophomore or junior or senior, someone a little bit of an upperclassman, and they look back at that lifestyle that they were a part of, some of them their freshman year, and they realize the emptiness of it they realize the hollowness in it. And they said, man, surely there's gotta be more. Your viewing world, your neighbor, your coworker, your family member, it it may look like they've got it all together, but I promise you, based upon what the word of God has to say to us this morning, there is a false hope. There is a false gospel in our watching and viewing world so desperately need to see the freedom that the sinner has found in Christ Jesus. So what is our persuasion to avoid? Our persuasion to avoid is something that is highly offensive to God and is highly detrimental for man. And that is legalism. What put these people in this position what, what made them think that they could walk up to someone who has heard the gospel from Paul? And what, what possibly was their motivation to walk up to them and say, you know what, there's a different way. It was their motivation and drive, the scripture tells us in chapter four, that because they wanted to build up their own following. They had these false motives and they ended up placing their hope in a false teaching. The persuasion to avoid that drove them into this position that they're in is that of legalism. But we've got to look at what legalism is because sometimes we get that wrong. Let's be very careful here. What is legalism? Warren Wiersbe has this to say. Legalism does not mean the setting of spiritual standards. Legalism does not mean the setting of spiritual standards. It means worshiping those standards and thinking we are spiritual because we obey them. It also means judging believers on the basis of 
those standards. That's exactly the way in which the individuals that make up the churches of Galatia are being treated and persecuted. Hey, I've got some standards of my own. I want you to uphold them, live up to them. By the way, it's very necessary for your salvation. Can you just sense the pulse rate of Paul in this letter? This, is, this has everything to do with, with a nature of our salvation. And the fact of the matter is that it is through Christ and Christ alone. Living a legalistic lifestyle, banking on a works-based mentality such as circumcision, a, a, attempting to uphold the law for the means of salvation. This all produces a false hope. You and I need to understand in closing that as followers of Christ, we follow Jesus not with an unjoyful attitude, but rather a motive that's driven by what Christ has done, by what he's doing, and what he one day will do. Freely he's justified us. Now he's sanctifying us. One day he will glorify us. We get to rest in that freedom. But if you want to remain in that freedom, you have to stand firm. You have to dig your heels into the ground and not be swayed and not be moved by the attempts of our culture, by the, the thoughts, by your circumstances, by your feelings. In order to avoid the wrong way, on the one way. Here's my application to you. Walk yourself through the gospel. Every day, walk yourself through the gospel multiple times a day so that you don't ever forget that God's riches at Christ's expense are more than enough. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for the fact that you saw us in our sin, in our separation, and you sent your best. You sent your son, Christ Jesus, to be beamed up on the cross, carrying the weight of your wrath, carrying the weight of my sin on the very shoulders of our Messiah. Father, I want to live life in view of through that lens, through that perspective of knowing your defeating the grave has set me free as a child of God. Well, Father, I know that there are different people in the room that experientially right now, they're forgetting where they're at positionally in you. Father, may that just not be the case. Such as it was with the Galatians, they were bought out by something cheap, something broken. But Father, no matter where each individual is at in this room. I ask that you would search us, know our hearts. Father, through your word, thank you for reminding us that we are free and it's for freedom that you have set us free. May we embrace this freedom by standing firm and looking to the sufficiency that's found only in you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.